Hello, my friends. So we are at the end of week two. Happy Friday. And today we're going to focus just a little bit on part of the story of Jesus and the essential aspect, the Christ. So if you are somebody that is part of a tradition that has a liturgical calendar that follows Lent, this coming Sunday will be the third Sunday of Lent. And in this third Sunday of Lent, we have the Ten Commandments are given. We have those. And we have some, the reading is from the Gospel of John, the, the Gospel reading. And it's John chapter 2. So it's early on in Jesus's ministry. You know, shortly after the baptism. In the other Gospels, this passage comes later. It comes closer to Holy Week, which would be towards the end of his life. And legend or history, there's a, a sensibility that Jesus was in healing ministry for three years until he was crucified. So this story in John's is situated early on in the ministry. Now, that being said, John of all the gospels is the one that is even more concerned with the spiritual themes and less concerned with the history as a chronological event. All the gospels kind of let the stories be in a certain rhythm, serving their underlying messages to the people that they're speaking to. So, Luke, of course, has the Annunciation and, and certain events that happen chronologically, and Matthew and Mark have that as well. But none of them are beholden to only be attempting to be chronological. They are really all about spiritual themes to the people that they're recording the stories for, which is very powerful. I actually love that about the four Gospels, is that there wasn't an interest to being an archive of the story of Jesus. There was an interest in the encounter of the divine in humanity that is their, their thrust. And obviously I'm using my language there theologically and not theirs. So in this story, Jesus goes into Jerusalem and he comes into the temple, and you know this story if you have any familiarity with the Jesus stories. It says, in the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple. <clears throat> he said, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remember that it was written, Zeal for your house consumes me. The Jews, those that must have been around and Jesus when he was doing this, said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the people who asked him this took it literally. And they said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. And you're going to raise it in three days? Now, the subnote on that, not what Jesus says, but the subnote is he was speaking of the temple of his body. Part of what is in this message is that the wisdom of the ineffable is very different than our wisdom. There are two accompanying readings that go with this for the third Sunday of Lent, the 10 Commandments and a reading from 1 Corinthians, which says so eloquently that God's wisdom is nothing like human wisdom. In fact, God's wisdom makes human wisdom foolishness. And in the first Corinthians, there's a light reference to the fact that when we as human beings look for signs or look to understand with our minds, we won't get there. We won't get there. You have to take that seriously because 
so often we we look for signs. I know I love signs. When when I get a sign that's an affirmation of something that's moving or stirring in me, I feel like there's wind beneath my wings. But neither signs nor wisdom in our cognitive way of deciphering things will get us there. And where is this there? That we will be God incarnate. That we will be God incarnate. Jesus, I believe, is referring to the reality that our bodies can be destroyed. But as we awaken, that bears no effect upon us. And of course, if our bodies are destroyed and we haven't engaged in any awakening process, still that part of us is not destroyed because you can't destroy what is indestructible. So in this series of opening up the wild heart, we get a taste of Jesus here being free in his wild heart. I mean, what would it be like if you walked into a place and you saw that there was duplicity going on? Because obviously he's turning these tables over because it seems like the activity is diminishing the reverence and respect of it being a sacred place. And I don't believe it's objective. I think that you could be a vendor in a place like that and be wholly spiritually motivated and aligned, aligned with the divine. So I don't think it's a statement on that in a literal sense, but it has to do with intention. And what do you get from Jesus? Wow, you get such authority for somebody who's not even the head of that temple. Awakening into our wild heart unleashes that level of authority in us and that level of freedom. With that kind of authority goes great freedom. Freedom. I was looking at a few of Ajishanti's quotes about Christ and, and Jesus. So he has a book that he wrote about Jesus. So I'm going to interchange Christ and, and Jesus here. But I'm going to read a couple of the quotes. The first one is, a story has the power to creatively evoke your deeper nature. But if you put it in the world of time, it becomes a closed and locked door instead of a transparent mystery. Look at the juiciness of those words. So here, I'm bringing up the story, part of the story of Jesus. And it evokes something along the lines of our deeper nature, authority and freedom, integrity, wisdom that's not just of our worldly way of thinking. But if I take that story and I try to put it in this box of time, making it very black and white, if you take that story and put it in a box in time, making it black and white, it becomes, what does Aja say? A locked door and it's closed ended. If you don't put that story grounded and limited in time, it remains not just a mystery, a transparent mystery transparent mystery. So we use thoughts like this to evoke not our wisdom knowing so that we can get there because you're not going to get there that way. It's just not possible to get there that way. We do this so that we are moved to surrender, to surrender the limited ways that we use our faculties. Another quote he says about uh, Christ is to understand Christ is to understand ourselves. And the entry point, the only thing, Acha says, that, that can see the one everywhere is the one. 
is a why. <clears throat> So for our meditation today to kind of let that stir within us, we're going to do another version of Om Mani Padme Hum. So in Buddhist tradition, this is one of the most powerful mantras and definitely one of the mantras that has been uh, chanted, chanted by millions and millions through many, many, many generations but we're going to chant it slightly differently. And I will include the link in the email that you receive. So you can click on that link and you can listen to the full version. Now I'm going to do a little variation of that. So it's easy for us since you're in the quiet of your own home and I'm doing this as a recording, but why are we doing this? Because this chant has many imports and one of them is to awaken the Buddhist heart to awaken your Buddha nature, to awaken it. Christ, I believe, awakened to his Buddha nature. That's where his authority came from. That's where his freedom came from. Now you may never be called to go into a place where there's duplicity and make a scene, but you wanna be free enough and available enough that if that is your call, you hear it, and you can act on it. All right, good. This is gonna be a lot of fun. I really love this, this rendition of this chant. So I invite you to close your eyes and place your left hand upon the heart chakra and gently pulse the hand against the heart chakra, pushing the palm in lightly and letting the hand pull back a little. Sweet rhythm, back and forth, back and forth. With the light touch, awakening the heart, awakening the heart chakra. And let the hand rest upon the heart. And in the, your own way, ask, let your Buddha heart be awakened. Let your hands rest. Join in as you are able. Om Mani Padme Om Om Mani Padme Om Om Mani Padme We begin the next phrasing as you're able. Om Mane Padme Hum, 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 Om Mane Padme Hum. 
Omane Padme Om, Omane Padme Om, Omane Padme Om. Omane Padme Om, Omane Padme Om, Omane Padme Om Mane Padme Om 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 Om Mane Padme Om. 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 Om Mane Padme Om 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 Om Mane Padme Om. 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 And bring the left hand once again to the center of the heart chakra. Very lightly. Say quietly to yourself, I awaken my Buddha heart. I awaken, O oh Christ. the hand on the heart, putting the other hand on top and bow to your sacred heart, your wild heart, your free heart, your heart of all authority. And when you're ready, raise your eyes. Blessings, my friends.